Good afternoon, viewers. Today we are continuing our series on economic environment, and we are going to look at monetary and financial system. This is the money economy, the one we are going to be looking at, the monetary and the financial systems. And we are going to look at how we be able to regulate the money supply. We see how these commercial banks try to increase credit or create credit. And we shall, at the end of the day, we'll look at the dilemmas those commercial banks face upon profitability, liquidity, and the security, as we are going to see in throughout this video. So we can kick off. Let's first get to know what, what money is before we proceed to the other subtopics. And we are saying money, money is anything which is legally acceptable for carrying out transactions and discharge of debts. What do we mean by saying that is anything that is legally acceptable for, for carrying out transaction and discharge of debts? First of all, you have to understand that for, the, for, for something, for any particular item to be accepted as a medium of exchange, it must be trusted by the public or the public must have full trust in that item that it can be used to settle the obligations that may come in as a result of business operations. And we are saying that to settle payments, money must be a legal tender. Legal tender means that it must be accepted by everyone in the country in the settlement and discharge of debts. So anything we use to settle debts, so long as it is acceptable by the public, then we call that thing money, something which can be easily accepted by everyone when settling or when making payments. Then we can look at some of the functions of money. When we try to look at the, the functions of money, we are saying, the first one we are saying, money is a unit of account. A unit of account, it means that money can be used to, to measure the value, or it can be used as a unit of value when making computations. You know, with the, with, with the financial accounting, we do everything in the, in the monetary terms. If you are recording the transaction, if let's say you bought, let's say an asset, we recognize that money is going to be involved. We are not, we are not only recording the asset, as in the number of assets we are increasing, but we are also interested in looking at what is the cost or what is the value of that asset you are purchasing. So when you are using money, money can be used as a unit of value for carrying out calculations and accounting procedures. So as to affect business transactions, whatever we do within the transactions, they are, they are, they, they are in monetary terms. So, we just conclude by saying that money can be used as a unit of account. It is like a unit of measurement. If let's say you can measure water in two liters, then if you want to know the value of certain items or certain transactions you've made, you will just know them by looking at the money that is involved in those transactions. 
Okay, the next one we have money is a, med is a medium of exchange. A medium of exchange, here we are trying to look at, at money as, as in terms of helping us to know the commodities we are supposed to exchange or to give out or to receive when we are either buying or selling. It makes, it makes it easy to determine the value and the quantity of the, of the commodities that can be exchanged. If let's say someone has 10,000, we can easily know that in that 10,000, you can buy this and this quantity of items and that will give us the exchange value whereby you will be knowing that when I give out the 10,000, I'm able to receive less than 10,000 kilograms of less than sugar. That's how we use money as a medium of exchange. It helps us to know which quantities are we going to exchange in, town, in, in regard to the services we've received. The third one we can talk about, money is a standard measure of value. Standard measure of value, it means some, something standard, it means it can be acceptable by every person. So if you want to know that, if you want to know the, 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 the value of the item, if let's say the value of a motor vehicle, we can say that that motor vehicle costs us, is costing, let's say 10 million. That is the value of that asset. It means we can easily use money and we attach the prices on certain items. That's what we call it, it money being used as a standard measure of value. Because here we're saying through the use of money, the relative value or prices of commodities can be determined. We can use the money and we say that according to this item or this property, this plot of land you are selling, it will be having this and this value depending on other factors that you may consider that can help you get to set that price or that value of the, of, of the item. Then the other one, we can talk about money as a store of value. Is a store of value or wealth eh? in a sense that if at all you have assets, you can sell them and you keep the money. If let's say you have land and that land you want to sell it, when you sell it, you are going to receive money. When you receive money, you can keep that money. It means the land you had was able to raise a certain amount that you are going to keep it, to keep somewhere. If let's say you are going to keep it in the bank or you keep it anywhere because when, when you have that money, that money is not perishable. It's durable, it can be there for a long period of time. So you can keep it anywhere and you'll be knowing that when I sold such and such item, I got this amount and I kept it in the bank. So that's what we call money being used as a store of wealth. Then the other one is money helps us in planning and budgeting. When we are doing the forecasts, we always do the forecasts when we are using the costs or when you are using the monetary terms, especially when you are doing, if let's say when you are predicting the sales value and all of that, of course, when even if you are, you, you, you are forecasting sales units, at the end of the day, you have to value and look at the, 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 the value of that asset or the price of those items that you are trying to, forecast. So money helps us in forecasting because everything we do within the business transactions involves cash and that money can be used to, it can be used to allocate certain expenses or certain revenues that are going to come in into the organization depending on whatever kind of budget you are doing. The other one we can talk about is Market money makes it possible to 
money makes it possible for price mechanism to operate. Of course, when you are determining the price, prices are determined, are determined in the monetary values. When you are using price mechanism, that's where, when you are setting either minimum and the maximum prices, either if let's say the government wants to regulate the price of, of certain commodities, they may want to set a minimum and the maximum prices, but all of that is done through the use of money or they attach those prices in the monetary values. So we conclude by saying that money helps us to, to do the, the price mechanism or to price to give the price on certain commodities. Then the other one we can talk about is a standard measure of deferred payment. A standard measure of deferred payments is we, we, are look, we are looking at a scenario whereby you have let's say acquired some goods on credit and you have not yet paid, but you will pay in due time. But at the end of the day, when you are trying to pay back, you pay back in the monetary value. So it helps us to keep to keep the other transactions that we've we've done without necessarily having to physical cash that has been directly paid. Because here we are saying that money is a standard measure of deferred payments or future payments, hence making it possible to cut out transactions without immediate cash. It means that since we have, we, we can easily know the value of the items, we can give out those items and we, we, we receive those items without necessarily paying the cash at that, at that time. And you pay the cash later. So money helps us because if you can't know the, the, the value of the items you are giving out on credit, you can't issue them out. But if you know that I'm giving out such and such items, but I'm going to be demanding this person this amount, then at a later date, someone can come and offset. So we can proceed having seen the functions of money, We can try to look at some of the extics or the features of a good money. How is a good money looks like? These are some of the extics or the qualities or the features of good money. One, we have relatively scarce or relative scarcity. Here we are trying to look at that if, if this money is supposed to be used in the business transactions effectively, it must be scarce to the extent that if it is plenty, then we are going to lose value. It doesn't make sense like someone carrying a bag of money just to pick one item, let's say one bread, and you've taken a sack of money. So if the money is very scarce, it means that even the, even the people who don't have the money, they will give it value because when, some, when, the person can, when the person gets the money, that person can know how to value that amount and be able to plan for it because it is hard to, to get it. So if money is scarce, we expect that it's going to serve the best purpose. Why? Because if it becomes plenty, we all when it is too much in saturation, we expect that people are going to misuse the money. At the end of the day, the prices of the goods will go high. But if the money is scarce, we expect that it will be having a good value that can make people do the exchange usefully. Then the other one we can talk about acceptability. We said that for, for money to settle any discharge, sorry, to discharge any debt, it must be legally accepted by the public. If the public accepts that anything, that we can 
offer to people when you are offsetting the debts, then we can say that that's money. And we are saying acceptability is when the public is in agreement with whatever transaction that are supposed to be done using the money. Here we are saying that it must be general, generally acceptable by the public for the discharge and other purposes for which money is needed. We don't need money just to discharge off the debts. We have we need money to purchase items to eat. There are so many things we do with money to reinvest the money. So if it is legally accepted by the public, then we say that that's a good money. Then the other one, the good, a good money must be durable. The durability comes in in a sense that if it is kept somewhere, at least it should take some time to, to get damaged or destroyed by any, any item that may come into contact with it. With it. And basically what we are trying to look at, we are trying to look at the durability in terms of when we are exchanging, when we are using the money, it is within the saturation and people are using it. So when people is, when money is exchanging ants or when money is moving from one person to another person, it should be able to last long so that it can be able to facilitate, facilitate the transactions without being damaged or destroyed within the transit. The other one we can talk about is homogeneity. Homogeneity or uniformity is when the identical notes and the, the coins, they, they must be the same. Being the same, we mean that if, if it is 1,000 notes, it should be the same to different people that are using that same note. If it is 1,000, in Kampala, it should be 1,000. In Guru, it should be 1,000 in Masaka. So that's what we mean by uniformity. If it is a, a 5,000 note, it should be the same like for all the people that are using this, that same 5,000 note. That's what we mean by uniformity. The other one we can talk about is portability or convenience. In here, we are trying to look at the money should be portable in the extent that when you are, in the extent that when, when, when you are making transactions, that money shouldn't be too heavy or too bulky to carry when you are making transactions. It doesn't necessarily mean that a 5,000, a 50,000 note should weigh more than the 2,000 note. They should be having the same they should be having the same weight, though the values are supposed to be different. You may find that 50,000 note is, is having the same weight as the 2,000 note. That's what we mean by portability. It should be portable. The extent that if you are, tra if you are making transactions, it shouldn't be giving you so much headache in terms of their transportation because it's heavy. So having known that, we have the, the fourth the last is divisibility. Divisibility here we are trying to look at that if you have a 50,000 note, it should, it should be divided or it, it, it should be very easy for the person who is making transactions to divide that amount so that it can finance these small transactions that may happen because it doesn't make sense for someone to take let's say a 50,000 note and you find that someone cannot even that 50,000 note cannot be even break someone cannot break it like having different items if let's say you have 50,000 note but you want to buy something for 500 you should be able to get the balances or it's supposed to be distributed and you get your balances that's what we mean by divisibility 
here we are saying that it should be able to divide into smaller denominations without losing value in order to make it to make it possible for smaller transactions what we, what we've learned that is supposed to be able to be divided into smaller units and when you're dividing it it shouldn't lose its value the, that's the main the, the, the main it's supposed to be divided and when you're dividing it it shouldn't lose its value then the other one we can talk about the third last is hard to forge of course you know forger is everywhere people can be able to manipulate these coins and notes but if that money if 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 you are supposed to be having a good money, it should be hard to forge. If at all, if, if at all someone tries to forge it, it should be having different features that may identify the fake one and the right one. That's what we mean. It should be hard to forge. That to the extent that even if someone has tried to, there are some features that may not be appearing in the forged item than the original. That's what we mean. Then. The second last, we have economy. Economy here, we are talking about the cost of printing. When you are, when you are trying to print that cost, the, the, whatever note we are, we are printing, it doesn't necessarily make sense for you to print a 50,000 50, note and you spend 60,000. 60, Sorry, 60, uh, yes, 60,000. Of course, if you are printing, let's say we are printing, you are printing 10,000 note that cost of printing that 10,000 notes should be lower than the value of the money you are printing. Of course, when you are printing the money, it should be not exceeding the value of the money you are printing. That's the basis. Then the last one we can talk about, but they are not just limited to these ones, but those are the ones I at least selected for. This level, I know they can't ask something going below, going, going be beyond 10, that you give more than 10 points, it's hard. But at least I can give you this and you add on when you make your own research. The other one, the last one we can talk about is identifiable. When, when, you, want to, when you want to be having good money, it should be easily recognized and distinguished from other items that even if even if you just give it to a kid the kid can know that whatever i'm holding is money that's what we mean it should be able to be distinguished or differentiated from other items so allow me to proceed to the next slide and we try to look at it money supply money supply here we are just looking at how money is saturating in an economy is the money high in the economy or is it low and what are some of the consequences that may happen if you are told we have a high amount of money or we have a low amount of money in the saturation is money scarce in the in the saturation is the money not there or is the money is there in print and what are what are the items that can lead to an increase or a decrease in money supply? Those are the things we are going to look at. We said money supply refers to the amount of money circulating in an economy at a given period of time. We are looking at a given period of time because money is ever there. It is always high and low. But what are some of the, the causes that may lead to low circulation? or a high saturation of money within an economy. Let's start to look at some of the types of money supply and we have endogenous or automatic money supply. This automatic money supply is where, is the kind of money supply which is determined by the level of economic activities that are taking place within the country or within an economy. 
This level of activities we are talking about, the level of output, if at all people are producing more, we expect that demand is going to be more in saturation because people are caught. The more you produce, the more you consume. And that's normally the case in developing countries because we have a lot, we have, the population is very high so the demand is always there. When we produce more, we expect that even the money is going to be a lot in saturation. If we look at the interest rate, is the interest rate low or the interest rate is high? If the interest rate is high, we expect that money is going to be less in saturation. If it is low, we expect that money is going to be high in saturation because people can easily get the money from banks and other financial institutions. That's the indigenous, which is the type of money supply that is determined by the level of economic activities. The other one we can look at it is the exogenous or the discretionary money supply. This is a this is a situation where money supplies is being determined by monetary authorities or the central bank. And the money, the, the money in situation doesn't depend on the level of economic activities that are within the economy. What do we mean by money being controlled or determined by the monetary, the, the monetary authorities? You know, from the point that, well, the, it's only the central bank that regulates the amount of money in circulation. It can either determine how much we should be having. If at all the situation, if let's say we have an inflation and they want to control the inflation, they may say that we reduce the money in circulation. How can they do that is by increasing the taxes, of course, the direct taxes. When they increase the direct taxes, it means we are going to remain with less disposable income that will cause us to reduce the money in saturation. Those are the sum of, if, if at all there is, the economy is not in inflation, there is deflation, then we expect that they are going to increase money in saturation according to whatever scenario that may happen. But what we should know is that exogenous is one that is affected by the activities or the role that are played by this central bank in an economy, but not the level of activity. Okay, we can proceed to the next one and we we'll try to look at what are some of the determinants. I told you what makes the money to be high in saturation and what makes the money to be less in saturation. These are the factors we are going to be looking at. They are called factors, determinant, and or other terminologies. But when you're talking about determinants of money supply, you have to be keen. Here we are not looking at when the money supply, when the when when the money is high in saturation. And we are not looking at when money is low in saturation. You know, with this economic environment, it is very slippery to the extent that they may bring exactly the same question and we handle it here, but you try to look at the you try to you try to get the points when you cannot even raise them. Here, when you are trying to look at the determinants of market of money supply, we are looking at at the money supply being high or low. It is a two way, meaning if the question comes and says, what are some of the factors that may cause an increase in money supply? Then you'll be using the same points, but you'll give you'll be giving giving only the other side that leads to an increase in money supply. Hope you can be able to, to, to analyze that and we'll be able to understand everything. One, we have the amount of money printed by the central bank. Remember in the first, the first type we saw that it was exogenous. Exogenous means the money in saturation is, is controlled by the central bank. So if the central bank prints, more money into the, the, the public. If it prints more money, we expect that we are going to be having a high, a high 
money supply. But when it prints less, then we expect it to, to be having a low level of money supply. Here we are trying to look at, these points are in general. If you try to look at amounts of, of money printed by the central bank, and here we proceed by saying that if the central bank prints more money, then money supply is, in, is supposed to increase and vice versa. Vice versa means, means that if the central bank pr prints less money, we expect that you are going to be having a low money supply. That's what we mean. So when you see the vice versa, don't just stop there and you, you think it is done. I'm going to be explaining as we go on. The next point is balance of payment surplus or deficit. We are looking at the surplus or the deficit. If at all we have a surplus, then we expect that we are going to be having a lot of money in circulation. But if you have a balance of payment deficit, then we are going to be having less money in circulation. That's how you explain these points. And when the question comes and once the, the only when it is one-sided, you give it the point when you have, if let's say the question says, give, a, give us some factors that lead to an increase in money supply, we should just say balance of payment surplus. Of course, that one leads to an increase in money supply. But if the question comes when it is general, what are the factors that affect or that determine the money in saturation? Then you're supposed to give balance of payment, surplus, or deficit. Hope you, you can get that. The next one is the level of credit, credit creation. This one, we are going to look at it. but. So to give you a brief idea about it is that we are trying to look at the commercial banks. How do they increase their credit by giving out money through those checks and whatever? But we are going to look at it as a topic of its own, as a, sorry, as a sub a subtopic of its own, because we have some competitions. How do we be able to increase the credit creation? And what are some of the factors that we consider? when you want to increase or to reduce the credit created. So here as a point, we are looking at the level of credit creation by the, by the commercial banks. If at all they can create more credit, we expect that the money supply is going to increase. And it increases by the other multiplier process as we shall see that. But if at all the level of creation of credit by the commercial bank reduces, we expect that even the money in circulation is going to be less. The other one is the level of economic activities. We said that endogenous is the one which is affected by the level of economic activities. If at all the activities are booming, we expect that the money is going to be much in circulation and less when the level of activities are lower in an economy for a given period of time. The other one we have the activities of open market operations. Open market operations, th those are the terminologies that are used by, or some of the tools that are used by the central bank when they want to increase or reduce money in saturation. The activities of, of open market operations, these are buying and selling of government securities, treasury bills and bonds. One of them is more than one year, the other one is a long-term asset. So if at all these, these government securities have been sold to the public, we expect that we are reducing money in circulation. Why? Because when you're selling goods to the public, it means it's like when someone is issuing shares to the public, they are trying to remove money from the public. They are trying to borrow money from the public. But when, when you buy them, you are, because when you buy, you give them money and you, you retain the, 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 the shares or the bills and bonds. So that's what we mean. If at all we are buying treasury bills and bonds from the public, we are increasing money supply. But when you are selling, Treasury bills and bonds to the public, we are reducing money 
supply because we are removing the money from the public. Then the other one we can talk about the level of monetization of the economy. Of course, if the, 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 the economy is monetized, if everything is done in, in monetary form, then we expect that we are going to be having a lot of money in circulation. But if at all we are using butter, butter trade as a system of exchange, we expect that we are not going to be having more money in circulation because we are not using money as a term of exchange or as a medium of exchange. And here we are saying that the greater the subsistence sector, the lower the money supply in the economy and the higher the monetization of the economy, the higher the money supply. The subsistence sector, of course, when you're producing something to eat, you produce items, but you eat them all. You don't even sell. It means you're not receiving money. That's what we mean by that. And the other one is manipulation of the bank, the bank rate. The bank rate is a rate that is charged by the central bank is the one that is charged by the central bank to commercial banks when they go to borrow money from the central bank. You know, central bank is a lender of last resort or is a banker to commercial banks. It means that every transaction that those commercial banks are doing, they do them following the guidelines of central bank. So when, when, when the commercial banks are borrowing money from the, from the central bank, the central bank can be able to regulate the money that is in circulation by using the bank rate or by manipulating or changing the bank rate. When they try to increase the bank rate, it means they are reducing the money in circulation because when they increase the bank rate, it means that even the central bank is going to borrow less money. And when it borrows less money, when central when when the, those commercial banks are giving money to the public they will just also increase their interest rate what you have to understand is that the bank rate is the one that is judged by the, the central bank to the commercial banks but the interest rate is the one that is charged by the commercial banks to customers hope you'll be able to understand that but where it where does it come it comes from the bank rate when the central bank increases the bank rate, we expect that commercial banks are going to borrow less money. And when they borrow less money, we expect that they are going to charge a high interest. And when they charge high interest, we expect that even the public will, will borrow less money because of a high interest. And if all that happens, we expect that the money supply is going to be less. But if at all, the bank rate is less. We expect that the commercial banks are going to borrow more money. And when they buy, when they borrow more money, we expect that they are going to be charging a lower interest rate. As they charge lower interest rate, the customers are also going to be getting a lot of money and therefore the money supply will be high. Hope you've got that. Then the, the last one we can do, we can see, but it's not, they are not done, you can search for your own and you add some. We have the level of legal reserve requirement. Legal reserve requirement, all of these are just the, the tools that are, or the instruments that are used by the central bank to regulate money in saturation. This legal reserve requirement is, is the amount of money that the central bank requires the commercial bank to deposit with it. So when they deposit that money in, with the, with, when, the central, when the commercial banks deposit that money to the commercial bank, it means that they are reducing the money they have or they are reducing the borrowing capacity, the money that's supposed to be borrowed from those commercial banks. So what happens is that if the central bank wants to regulate the money in circulation, what it does with this legal, legal reserve requirement, they increase the legal reserve requirement. Remember I said, this is a statutory or a, a legal 
max minimum amount of money that is required by the central bank to be deposited by the commercial banks. So if the central bank wants to, to, to reduce money in circulation, they will just increase that legal reserve requirement. When more money is kept in, in the reserves, we expect that the money in circulation is going to be less. But if they reduce the, the legal or the minimum reserve requirement, it means we are going to be having a lot of money in circulation. And that's how we can explain that. Okay, I hope we stop here for, for today. Then the next, the next, the next, the next video is going to start from the demand for money. I don't want to mix this demand for money with the money supply because you get a bit confused, but at least I want you to appreciate because here we are going to be having some theories and all of that. Allow me bring them at a later or the next video so that you'll be able to understand it and grab it with more understanding. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe because the more you subscribe and you share so that others also can be having a benefit, they can also get to understand some of these concepts, you'll be helping the everyone to be able to understand these concepts and be able to do or to see their papers with the confidence that they can pass because they have got exactly what they wanted. Thank you.